Next slide, please. The title of today's webinar is taken from a recently released study of early college high schools prepared by the American Institutes for Research. In addition to hearing about this study, you'll learn about this particular approach to accelerated learning from a variety of perspectives, partnering organizations, the school, and the higher ed perspective. Next slide, please. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, the College and Career Readiness and Success Center, which is housed at the American Institutes for Research, is part of a network of federally funded centers that provide technical assistance and resources to our regional partners and the states they serve on key educational reform issues. The American Youth Policy Forum, our co-host today, is a lead partner of the College and Career Readiness and Success Center. As a College and Career Readiness and Success technical hub, we collaborate with the federal and external centers and resource providers to promote knowledge development, dissemination, and utilization through technology-based activities such as this webinar today. Next slide, please. Here you'll see a screenshot of our website. Uh, we invite you to visit the website to access a copy of this webinar and to learn uh, more about other college and career readiness and success resources and activities that might be of interest to you and your colleagues. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is the second in a three-part series focused on accelerated learning. The College and Career Readiness and Success Center wrote this brief to help bring some clarity to the use of the term acceleration by focusing on strategies both within and across secondary and post-secondary education that allow students to build momentum toward long-term success. Originally developed to serve as enrichment opportunities for students who were high achievers, accelerated learning options also have been used to engage middle and low achievers in their learning and increase academic momentum for underrepresented student populations. Today's webinar features one such strategy, the early college high school, an approach to acceleration that began more than 10 years ago with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Next slide, please. We're pleased today to have a terrific panel of uh, presenters who are going to talk about uh, early college high schools. Uh, we'll hear first from Joel, who will provide an overview of early college high schools and JFF's role in the initiatives. And then we'll hear from uh, Mike Sinclair, who will discuss the school perspective. Uh, Julie Penley, who will share the experience of a higher education partner, and Andrea Berger, who will share the research findings I mentioned earlier. We'll pause between each presenters uh, to give you all an opportunity to pose clarifying questions, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have another opportunity to uh, engage in uh, additional conversation. So I'd like to begin by introducing Joel Vargas, Vice President of Jobs for the Future, uh, who leads the high school through college team and helps uh, set the organization's priorities and direction. He also researches and advises on state policies to promote improved high school and post-secondary success for underserved students. Since joining JFF in 2002, uh, Dr. Vargas has designed and implemented a research and state policy agenda for implementing early college designs. He's created policy frameworks, tools, and model legislation, written and edited white papers, research, and national publications, provided technical assistance to state task forces and policy work groups, and served on a number of national advisory groups, and organized and presented at national policy conferences. In 2005, Dr. Vargas was featured in the Chronicle of Higher Ed as one of higher education's next generation of thinkers. And I might add, Joel is a good friend and partner of the College and Career Readiness and Success Center. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Joel. Thanks. And um, Helen, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I, I want to thank um, you and AIR and the American Youth Policy Forum and, and those who are on the call today uh, for having uh, be for taking the time to listen to me about early college schools and to 
you know, try to be a resource to you and to the uh, college and career readiness and success center. The work you do, you're doing is so important. Um, as Helen said, I'm vice president at, of uh, high school through college transitions at JSF, Jobs for the Future. And as part of my work throughout my 11 years here, I've, I've really been privileged to be a part of contributing to the development and expansion of this successful innovation, early college schools. Um, that increase high school and college success of low income and underrepresented youth. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, I just want to say a word or two about JSF. This work has really been one integral strategy for meeting the mission of Jobs for the Future, uh, which is dedicated to ensuring that low income youth and struggling workers in our economy get the skills and credentials they need to enter careers with family sustaining wages now. It's just the floor uh, in this economy. And this slide shows um, that we try to address these goals by addressing several leaks in the education and workforce pipeline that prevent so many young people from earning the post-secondary credentials that um, are the key to economic success, as I said. So the next slide, please. This uh, begins to uh, illustrate how we do our work. Uh, we work with school districts, colleges, employers, state and federal leaders, and other other intermediary organizations, which I'll talk about a little later, to develop and test and document promising evidence-based innovations, as that left-hand column uh, illustrates in the middle, if you sort of move to that. We also uh, apply resources and services, leveraging the expertise of my colleagues here at JFF to build capacity in the field to develop and implement these models successfully um, and get them ready for scale if they're successful. We develop, for example, practices and policy guides, professional development models and labor market analytics. And to move to the last column, uh, last but not least, uh, we advocate for the policy conditions that are really important uh, needed to implement innovations and scale up promising solutions like early college. Next slide, please. Um, and speaking of early college, these are the very kind of strategies that you saw on the earlier slide that we pursued in our work on early college over the last 11 years. Um, to start, I, I've been asked to do a little definitional work about what we mean by early college schools and, and uh, those that are part of the, the schools that I'll be talking about today and uh, of which Mike is a part and others are referring to, um, as well as El Paso College. They're small schools. They often extend to incorporate the middle school grades, and they all work in partnership with local colleges to offer a program that enables students to earn up to two years of transferable college credit or an associate's degree um, by graduation of high school. They're often located on college campuses, and uh, not all of them are, but if they're not, then they're near campuses, typically to utilize the power of place to help students build a college-going identity. And they target, uh, can't emphasize this enough, they really target low-income and underrepresented students who are traditionally at risk of not graduating high school or or not graduating ready for college and careers. And they emphasize keeping students on an accelerated path in their education um, and uh, offer that with support, you know, versus slowing things down, which typically in our experience uh, only leads to more slowing down and tracking away from college and career ready uh, paths. So that's an important feature. Next slide, please. So people begin to ask when you, you know, kind of end on that note and you describe the students, why would you build this kind of high school for these students, quote unquote? You know, it's kind of counterintuitive, but there are at least a couple of reasons. I'm sure you out there can, can name any more and have experience with this. But, you know, many of the reasons why these students don't progress at higher rates to and through uh, college have to do, yeah, they have to do with the academic, social, and financial barriers that, um, that the, our systems really erect and structure between high school and college. You know, what early college schools do in theory is to eliminate those boundaries and barriers and make explicit what is expected in high school to be successful in college. You know, not just in terms of content, um, academic content, although that is very important, but also uh, in terms of metacognitive skills, which I know many more people are familiar with as a result of uh, the work of David Conley and others in the college readiness field. Uh, and, you know, for example, the behaviors and the study habits of college students uh, that can be best learned by through authentic rehearsal in, uh, in an early college experience. 
Uh, also, the ability to take college courses for free for students uh, really breaks down many of the financial barriers to college and is really motivational. Um, and there's also a bet here that some, some early college success in college can build students' momentum to finish a degree or credential and not to stop out of college, as so many of these young people do, even if they manage to find their way into college. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, I guess I would uh, end on that last slide by saying you're going to hear that the evidence actually seems to back up those theories, um, as you'll hear from my colleague Andrew Berger a little bit later. Uh, and what, you know, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the origins of this uh, movement. The spread of the schools, as Helen mentioned, was catalyzed over a decade ago by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other philanthropies such as Carnegie and Kellogg Foundations, which, through startup funds, um, really helped to spark local support by local school districts and colleges to start or deepen partnerships that they had with, with uh, between colleges and districts to start early college schools. And JFS played a management role, and in that role we worked over the years with 13 national uh, intermediary partners uh, that are listed here on this slide that provided technical assistance to local sites on design issues. We facilitated um, peer learning so people didn't have to recreate the wheel. Uh, we often uh, supported professional development programs and advocated at the local, state, and federal levels for policies to really try to smooth implementation for these uh, models. Next slide, please. You know, as a result of this work uh, and the work of these organizations, uh, there are about 280 schools that have been initiated in 26 states, and that, that is not to count the many uh, local communities and states that have started early colleges of their own accord and with their own support over the years. Uh, and by our count, that numbers uh, at least 100 other, other schools by our informal scanning of the field. Um, you'll hear from Andrea again in a bit that the schools have had tremendously impressive outcomes in raising uh, high school graduation rates, college enrollment and completion rates. And uh, the most recent research is, is quite consistent with other rigorous studies of the two largest state networks of early college schools in North Carolina and Texas. JFF has been collecting, you know, just as an aside, um, our own data uh, over a number of years from schools in the network, including a robust longitudinal data set from about 100 schools. And we're going we're gonna to be publishing our findings in the next month ourselves, uh, so be on the lookout for that, uh, which I think will, will complement quite nicely AIR's recent research uh, findings. Next slide, please. In that report, we'll really emphasize, you know, not just the results, but really the, the defining characteristics that have made early college schools so successful. Uh, and I tried to capture those in a few words here. One is that they, the, it, it, in terms of structure, they've really integrated high school and college in um, meaningful uh, ways, including through authentic college course taking experiences. As I mentioned, uh, most of the courses are taught on college campuses. Uh, while the courses can be offered successfully in a number of ways, you know, including on high school campuses, we think that's a good thing. We also think it's really important that students get some exposure to the college environment as part of their early college experience. Um, instruction. We uh, will des describe the instructional changes visible in successful early college schools that really need to take place for teachers in the schools to help heterogeneous uh, learners accelerate uh, to and through uh, college coursework. Easier said than done, takes a lot of hard work in the classroom at that level, not just at the structural level. And teachers really need to differentiate their instruction and engage in student-centered instructional practices. Um, there are also what's important in integral support systems that are very important to have in place that you'll hear, uh, you'll get a little bit more detail from Mike about those, such as tutoring, advisory, bridge courses, cohort support groups, college seminar courses, we could go on and you'll hear more detail later. Uh, also, partnerships and policy. To take the first one first, partnerships. It's really important that K-12 and college partners collaborate and coordinate closely on the design and execution of early colleges to make them successful. You know, both these institutions are, in a sense, taking responsibility, joint responsibility, for students' uh, successful transition from high school into and through college. And they need to really coordinate on getting the resources, the planning, and the agreements right from the start. And you know, finally, uh, policies can either enable or inhibit uh, these uh, partnerships from happening. 
because uh, you know policies are set up for siloed sectors typically. Uh, so it really does help when state policies encourage and don't penalize at a minimum uh, partners who are trying to facilitate the, the sharing of credits, personnel, and dollars across the two systems. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to begin to segue to my next uh, colleagues here, but uh, I want to say that uh, let you know that JSF's work on early college uh, is continuing. We we want to spread the success of these schools to many other students who can benefit uh, nationally. We're doing so by partnering with districts on new initiatives, you know, a number of which have uh, sought us out actually to secure our services and contract on a contract basis to help them develop and expand early college. We've been adapting the design, as you'll see here from three of the examples of adaptations to help school districts install early college for all their high school students, um, including through acceleration to technical post-secondary credentials, which is an emphasis of our Pathways uh, to Prosperity Network in conjunction with Harvard University, and through uh, I3 validation grants that scale up early college designs in South Texas and in Denver Public Schools. Uh, we've also, we're also doing work with Chicago Public Schools and Dayton Public Schools. So anyway, there's, there's a lot more to learn about the success of these next generation early college models and we just feel that there's a strong enough track record of uh, success at this point to build on and that the need is just uh, as it was when we started this initiative. It is too great and urgent uh, for the many students nationally uh, to wait, you know, and we, we feel that we are able to move forward pretty responsibly to spread these strategies more widely. Uh, next slide, please. So I would just uh, end by saying thank you. I look forward to learning from the other presenters today, and I know you'll learn a lot, and I look for, forward to hearing your, your questions and about your interests uh, in early college today. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Joel. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one uh, thing we'd like to know is, whether you could talk about the one or two policy barriers that you have had to address uh, to ensure the success of the early college high schools. Yeah, it is a great question. Um, so I would say the major one has been the way that funding uh, can flow in order for the college and high school partners to pay for tuition. And uh, one of the, you know, one example of that is uh, there are still a number of states, although there used to be many more, that would say, hey, you can't, you know, high school and college, you're serving the same student. You cannot both claim state funding for that student uh, because that would be double dipping. And, uh, you know, they didn't get that uh, really what the schools were trying to do was to both uh, support, you know, Support, it had both institutions support students in an accelerated program of study that at the end of the day would move students much more efficiently uh, into and through a post-secondary credential. So that is probably the biggest example. There are some others that I uh, can cite as well that have to do with, you know, just some details of uh, who is eligible for, for the college courses and, uh, you know, how you want to balance uh, making sure students are ready for the courses. Um, but also not, um, you know, not setting the, the standards so high that only, you know, that only students who could be admitted to a flagship uh, university uh, could be admitted to, you know, a college course and in, uh, introductory English composition course at the college level. Those are very different kinds of criteria. So uh, those are just a couple of examples. Thank you. And, and you mentioned uh, that early college schools are small, and one of our audience members wants to know how you define small and whether there are uh, rural schools that you target. Yes, uh, on both counts. Um, the early college high schools generally uh, in this initiative numbered uh, from as small as 200 um, to as large as probably no more than about 500. Um, and on average, probably about, I want to say 350, somewhere around in that range. And there are a number of school of early college schools in rural settings, uh, particularly in, in North Carolina and in Texas, although not only there, uh, including in some rural areas in California, the few that there are, but there are some there. Uh, and in uh, Georgia, um, I can cite others as well. But I do want to emphasize that now, even though these early college schools were designed to be small, uh, we do see an increasing number, including with our 
instigation um, of larger schools trying to take on these early college strategies in new high school settings, not just small ones. Great. Thank you. I'd like to transition now to uh, Mike Sinclair, who uh, has been in education for uh, 18 years as a high school teacher, as a middle school coach, um, and as an administrator. Uh, he served for four years as a Title I principal in Greenville, South Carolina, before uh, opening Brazier Middle College Charter High School in 2006. Uh, Brazier Middle College continues to be a leader as a charter school, as a middle college, uh, and has one of the state's highest graduation rates. Uh, Mr. Sinclair also has served as the chairman of the Palmetto Charter Network and the Public Charter School Alliance in South Carolina. And he was chosen as the uh, Palmetto Charter Network um, Public Charter School Alliance Principal of the Year in 2012. Um, so with that, I'll transition to you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. It's uh, real exciting to to be here today down in the south. Everything's nice and icy, so being indoors talking is uh, not a bad place to be. Um, we do uh, have, have worked with JFF in the future, I mean in the past, and really um, they have a great database of information because one thing that's true about middle and early colleges is that each of us is slightly different based on your partner uh, college, uh, your state requirements, and your local school district. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with an overview. If you've got questions, just let um, Helen know. Uh, we opened in August of 2006 and had our first graduating class in 2010. We decided it was very important to open with one grade level at a time, so we started with just freshmen so that we could make sure that we got them the skills that they needed as they grew through. And now we're at 422 students in grades 9 through 12. Um, although a lot of middle and early colleges have a 13th year, South Carolina does not allow students to stay in high school for a 13th year. They would be considered non-graduates. So we have a memorandum of agreement with our college for that 13th year, and the college either waives that uh, tuition or they also use Pell Grants or lottery assistance um, or other scholarship. Um, so that 13th year is no uh, funds from the parent or the student. It is um, covered by the college. So they're able to go virtually tuition free there. Um, our uh, lottery, our en enrollment is based on a lottery. Um, we do have more students enroll for or apply for our school than we have um, slots. And so we have to go strictly by a lottery. Um, so we can't control uh, for different factors like some schools do. Next slide. Um, we are located in a more rural suburb of Greenville, South Carolina. We are on a satellite campus, which um, has some barriers of its own, um, but we are down there. Someone had asked about the rural, and we uh, have a lot of neighborhoods, but definitely um, more in a rural area. Our poverty index at this point is 36.6. We have 75% of our students that at are at minimal proficiency or below. Um, but we do graduate 98% of our students in four years, um, and we do get uh, great data from um, a state report that we help put together and that the state mines from South Carolina public universities and colleges. So the next little bit will kind of give you an overview of that. Um, you can see that 91% of our students go on to further their education, either a two- or a four-year institution um, with 5% in armed forces and 4% going straight into the workforce. Next slide. Um, one thing that we see a lot with um, the typical college student is they struggle that first semester of their uh, college career. Um, these are the pass rates for our students. So um, through our State Department of Education and our uh, Commission of Higher Education, we get a report on how our students did during the first semester. Um, so you can see our students are taking a large, diverse uh, listing of classes but are doing very well um, in those courses with um, earning passing rates. Okay. Um, we do uh, focus, if you go to the next slide, we do focus on a couple of important things with our course sequence. Due to uh, state age requirements for students to take college classes, our, uni our partner college does not allow our freshmen to enroll. And, and ultimately, that actually gives us time to work with them. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do with the freshmen later. Um, what we do in the spring of our freshman's year, they all take the compass test. 
Um, that is a requirement from our uh, college that they all earn the same cut scores as everyone else, and they must have completed their prerequisites classes, such as English 3 before they take an English 101 or 102 course, or Algebra 2 before they take a Math 110 or 111 course. Um, so we do make sure that they have all those prerequisites before they enroll. We do have some students that enroll in their sophomore year, about 25 percent. The majority will begin as a junior, and we do have some um, that will not start their careers until they are seniors, uh, but again, we try to accelerate the students as best they can and get them in when they are ready um, and provide that support, and, and they definitely begin to see themselves as college students, not just as high school students. All right, next slide. We see that the students that are not as um, prepared for the college setting. We want them to get in to get a, an experience and for us to kind of know judging what supports they would need. So the first two that we would have for that student that's not as um, successful getting into the college uh, courses would be college skills type class. We have a college skills 103 or a CPT which is um, a Microsoft suite college programming class 170. That way they, we know they've had some of those experiences. A typical student in our school would jump in with a Spanish foreign language class or an English class. Um, lots of the social science classes are a great jumping in point for those students um, because they'll have a lot of those skills based on the work we've been doing with them their freshman and sophomore year. Later in their careers is when we see them jumping into that Math 110, 111, which is the college algebra, which would then cycle um, into maybe a Math 140, 141 calculus. Uh, biology is typically the first life science or natural science that our students would get into um, simply because they've had a lot more life science um, through their educational process. Um, but that is um, honestly mostly a senior level class. Occasionally we'll have a junior get into the college sciences. Next slide. Our college environment um, that we separ uh, set up is very important. Um, as Joel was saying, to be on or have um, very close access to a college campus, we really think that the site provides a lot um, for our students. So we are in a high school building, but we are on the college campus. So students walk from our building into the college building for their courses. All college courses are taught in the college building, and they are taught by college instructors, either full-time or adjunct instructors. Um, our goal is that no more than 50% of the students in a class is made of our early college students. We really feel that it's important for, for them to be in that college setting. Um, unfortunately, on a satellite campus, sometimes the number of sections offered is limited and we go over the 50%. We also try to stay away from only having one student so they have a partner in that class that they can work together as a study group, um, gathering support, going to um, different supports together so they're not alone but we do want them to have a college experience, so we um, try to keep it down and um, have predominantly college students in those courses when possible. Next slide. Um, in, our, in our program, we really think that the freshman year is critical. Um, students that are coming to us are not coming from a middle school that's preparing them for college necessarily. They're preparing them from wherever they're gonna go. And so we've created a freshman seminar class, and in that class, we try to teach them um, a lot of the intangibles, uh, it's really a lot of the work's based on um, David Connolly's work as mentioned earlier. Um, and we really work on students' communication, students' ability to organize, students' ability to research, students' ability to take research and make meaning um, and be concise in their communications. We really teach them the importance of study groups, things like that. So we really try to bring them in and start them off um, with a focus on college readiness. Um, and Joel used that word college ready. We really emphasize to our students and parents that we want students that are college ready, not just college eligible. Big difference there. Um, and then each of our students in college take a college seminar class that I'll talk about in a second. But we, we called freshman seminar uh, a seminar to match our college seminar. Um, and then we also work with the college advisor and campus director to make sure the alignment is, is there. Next slide. Um, we really focus on Connolly's skills as we have there, but our college seminar, we have each semester students taking it. We really try to teach them very important skills such as pay attention to office hours because you know, they've got to make sure they know when to meet their professors, following a syllabus, reading the text carefully, uh, using study groups. That's one thing that we find that uh, a lot of students end up working in isolation and they socialize in groups. We want them to do both. We want them to be able to work in groups as they prepare. 
monitoring Blackboard that you're not going to have teachers telling you everything all the time. You got to advocate for yourself um, and make sure they're doing the best on every assignment that they have because we all know that in college you don't have a lot of homework grades or uh, extra credit and things like that. So they've got to make sure everyone counts as they go through um, on that. So lots of the intangible things, um, not focused on content, it's focused on student support in the college setting. All right, next. So when we're looking at our college relationship, we really think it's important to have um, someone from the college, the highest ranking person we can, that sits on our governing board. We as a charter school have a board of directors, um, but you may have um, an ECHS board or a school improvement council or an advisory committee, depending on what each school has. But it's really important to have the highest um, person you can in the hierarchy of the college because you want that person to make sure you understand the context of decisions at the college and you want them to understand the context of the high school so you have someone to advocate and keep you informed of what's going on there. Also a collaboration team is key for us. On our campus we have one college instructor in each core area and then two others, one in a foreign language that works really well with us. Um, and then we have the college advisor and the campus director and we meet together once a quarter to talk about how our students um, are doing and what supports we can uh, build together. Uh, it's been really neat to watch that progress because uh, in the last couple of meetings we've actually had the college instructors bringing their assignments and our students work so we can see how our students are doing and together we can help them understand maybe some things that they're not seeing in the work and they can help us understand better what we could use um, to help our students. So it's really grown from just informational to actually building the um, instructional support program on both ends, which um, is exactly what you want a collaboration team to be. All right, next slide. And finally, uh, you know, using our story with the economic um, situation that's facing so many schools, uh, it's easy to say that the early college programs are um, costing a lot of money, but we really like to focus on uh, what other public schools are doing and showing our university and showing our district that we are um, performing very well. We're also looking at workforce. You know, in, in Greenville, South Carolina, we have a lot of manufacturing with BMW and Michelin and uh, Bosch and several others. And it's really important that we're looking at meeting the needs of the workforce um, in our community. Um, and then finally, looking uh, to the college to really establish some of the stuff that um, they would like for us to do. So. Uh, it's, it's really exciting. I'd uh, be glad to answer any questions at this point. Each campus is a little bit different, but uh, that's kind of how we do it at Brazier. Thanks, uh, Mike. So uh, one question that has come in is whether or not you think the laws or policies in South Carolina limit uh, middle early colleges from expanding in the state. Um, I don't think that they limit. I think that in South Carolina we have a tuition um, waiver that the, that the universities and colleges can use and our students have been able to stay in there so it kind of takes away some of the economic drain that a lot of the colleges are uh, concerned about. We really have only seen them grow at the two-year technical schools. Uh, predominantly we have some four-year schools that are interested. Um, I think the biggest uh, con concern right now is uh, districts being able to allocate. I think um, historically AP classes and IV classes have been the only gatekeeper programs to getting those college credits um, and I think more people are starting to add. I know in Greenville County um, they have, uh, as far as the county schools, they've opened their first early college uh, in the last two years. So we're starting to see more and more open. Great, thank you. Um, another question that uh, was asked, um, oftentimes uh, there's pushback from college faculty who say that despite the fact that um, incoming uh, freshmen and sophomores um, have demonstrated the cognitive ability uh, to um, engage in college level work, they're, um, oh, you know, um, they're not sometimes emotionally able of handling college level work. Um, is that something that those transition courses you mentioned uh, begins to address and uh, is there any data to counter that view? Um, I mean, I, I, yes, I think the transition courses are definitely there. Uh, we also are very careful in looking at which courses we guide our students towards um, depending on the material that may be presented in those classes, um, something that we think may uh, need a little more of a maturity of the student. Um, so we are careful with that. We work very closely also with the advisor on the campus to make sure we understand what's going on there. 
But the biggest thing is we try to stay in communication through our um, collaboration team so that college instructors that have questions often will go to those college instructors that work with us to um, find out more about our students. And we always are open in communication that if something's going on with one of our students, uh, even, with, even if it's not a name, because some, some professors are more careful with privacy of information, um, we really try to be open to talk through that and coach our students um, as a whole. But we really, I don't have data on students that are more or less successful in that. First couple of years, a lot of apprehension from the college instructors, but uh, it's actually quite interesting that now they desire our students to be in their classes um, as much, if not more, than a traditional college student. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thanks, Mike. So um, now I'd like to uh, transition to uh, Dr. Julie Penley, um, who is from the El Paso Community College, where she uh, began her career in 2000 as a um, uh, faculty member in psychology. Um, she's taught face-to-face -face and online courses for traditional dual credit and early college high school students. Um, and she joined the administrative team at uh, El Paso Community College as Dean of Instructional Programs and Campus Dean of the Mission Del Paso Campus in 2011. Um, Dr. Penley also serves as the Administrative Liaison for EPCC's uh, Mission in Cotton Valley Early College High Schools. Um, Dr. Penley's work in psychology focused on stress and coping in uh, student and clinical setting in uh, samples. And uh, she's presented and published a variety of research focusing on undergraduate education, including dual credit trends at um, El Paso Community College. So with that, I'd like to transition over to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, a little bit about El Paso uh, Community College and, and the El Paso Service Region. And uh, some of you will probably remember the slide that Joel, uh, Joel showed with the uh, early colleges across the country. And within the state of Texas, most of the early colleges are in uh, central and, and east te Texas. And then there was this one little dot of red in far west Texas. And, and that was EPCC. Uh, we're on the border with Mexico as well as the state of New Mexico. Uh, our uh, population at EPCC is currently about 32,000 students. Uh, probably about 10 to 12 percent of those are early college or dual credit. Um, like most community colleges, we are an open access institution. Uh, we do not have uh, placement exam requirements to get into the school. And geographically, we're a fairly large service area. Um, I think the last um, numbers that I've seen show that our uh, district is about 125 square miles, and so we're, we're spread out geographically. We're spread out in terms of, of abilities and interests. And at EPCC's uh, six campuses, we try to uh, work with students where they are and, and help them meet their needs. Um, like a lot of early college um, partners, EPCC got involved primarily because of our administration. Uh, our president at the time had a very strong vision for access for all um, that fit nicely with the national model. And so we, we did get involved early with Jobs for the Future, with Educate Texas, and with some other uh, partners to help us bring early colleges to El Paso. And you'll see on the next slide currently where we are. We have six uh, early college high schools that we partner with. Um, within El Paso County, we have 12 uh, independent school districts. And so this slide shows you where our early college high schools are and who our ISD partner is. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, those four campuses are physically on any PCC campus. And much as Mike was describing, the students will, will either take a class in their building or they'll walk across the parking lot and take a class in our building. Um, if it's a, a dual credit class, whether it is um, at any PCC campus or, or on the early college campus, they're taught by uh, credentialed faculty. Uh, if they're taking a, a purely high school class, those are offered, uh, as you might expect, on the early college campus. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have two 
um, uh, off-site early college high schools. Cotton Valley is unique in that it is a partnership among three independent school districts, um, all of which are, are small, all of which serve uh, rural communities, mostly farming communities. And then our newest uh, early college high school <clears throat> is in Clint. Uh, they're also off-site. Uh, Clint is about five miles away from the closest DPCC campus, and Cotton Valley is about 17 miles away. On the next slide, we have our, uh, hopefully, what will be our seventh early college high school. Uh, Burgess is an interesting situation. It's currently a comprehensive high school serving about 1,500 students. And uh, the administration in El Paso ISD is very interested in converting that high school to a uh, comprehensive early college high school. They've received tentative approval from the state for that. Uh, and now we're rolling up our sleeves with our ISD partner to figure out how best to make this transition and how best to fulfill the model of early college high schools in such a large setting. Like Joel was saying, most of our uh, students do reflect that national model. Um, almost all of our early college students uh, at APCC are low income and first generation. Uh, a large number of them are also English language learners um, and, and have uh, other demographic or, or individual barriers that might otherwise limit their access to higher education. Uh, we try not to interfere too much with our uh, ISD partners in dictating the sequence of curriculum or the, or the time to graduation. Uh, most of our early college high schools will let students uh, progress if the student is uh, has shown competence and shown motivation to do so. Uh, one of our early colleges prefers to keep them on a on a uh, pretty tight schedule. That last school that I mentioned, uh, they do graduate their students at the end of four years with a high school diploma, and most of their students also graduate at that time with their associate's degree. At the other early college high schools we have, uh, students do have the flexibility to progress early. Uh, it's not unusual for, for students at those early colleges to graduate at the end of their high school junior year with their associate's degree. Uh, we call those early completers or early graduators, and we certainly like to uh, recognize those successes. But the bottom line is most of our students do graduate uh, either on time or early with their associate's degree. Those that do graduate early, we have a, uh, an understanding with our four-year partner in El Paso, the University of Texas at El Paso, for these early college students to continue their undergraduate education. Uh, at the university level. In addition, our early college students have been uh, extremely successful, not just in the classroom, but with research presentations, uh, conference presentations, and journal publications. Many of our students have been awarded internships, either locally or nationally, uh, in laboratories or political offices, um, community service organizations. And so, our students have been making a name for ourselves in the county, across the state, and across the nation. So going back a little bit to what I had mentioned at the beginning, um, the interest in early college high schools in El Paso primarily came uh, because of our logistics. We are separated from many of our uh, partners in the state of Texas. Uh, the closest higher ed institution outside of El Paso County is about four and a half hours away uh, by car. And so for many of our uh, residents, higher ed is pretty much a, a home court advantage. They stay in El Paso, uh, either at El Paso Community College or at the University of Texas. Some do travel into New Mexico, about 40 minutes away to NMSU, and, and some frankly find those barriers prohibitive and they if they can't get their educational needs met in El Paso, they, they don't pursue other options. And so we thought at the time when we were considering early college high schools that that was something we needed to address. And as Joel and Mike had mentioned, if we can get students 
uh, engaged, get them to understand the importance of college-going cultures and, and why college attainment is so important. We hope that we could give them a springboard to move on after the associate's degree. Um, a lot of it also came from the partnerships that we have in our education pipeline in El Paso. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with our independent school districts, uh, both the public and private um, districts in El Paso County. Uh, and we have a very strong partnership with uh, UTEP. And I think that it's that partnership between the president of UTEP and the president of EPCC at the time and, and their personal friendship that helped uh, begin these conversations back in the late 1990s. And so for us, um, the, that idea of college-going culture, of access, of why not meet the students where they are geographically, was a no-brainer and fortunately we were lucky to be able to partner with Jobs for the Future, with Lumina, with Gates to help uh, receive some initial seed funding to make this reality happen. Uh, Joel and, and Mike in particular had talked uh, about the buy-in and I wanted to expand a little bit more on that from the higher ed perspective. I don't think it was ever a question uh, that our administrators were on board. Certainly our, our president at the time was uh, free in sharing his story of his own students or, or his own children's struggle rather. Um, he saw one of his children be a traditional college student and, and all along this, this uh, daughter had said, I'm going to go to college and here's what I'm going to do when I grow up. Uh, his next child, his son, struggled a little bit, finding some uh, motivation, finding some uh, long-term goals. Uh, early college maybe wasn't the best option, but, but uh, his son eventually found his path. And then uh, Dr. Rhodes shared the story of his youngest daughter and how she, she struggled not so much academically, but from a motivational point of view, from a student support point of view, going through the K-12 pipeline. And, and frankly, he was very honest in saying, you know, my daughter would have been lost if she would have gone to a comprehensive high school where she was one of 1,500 or 1,600 students. And, and his story of how his daughter found her niche at an early college high school uh, in Utah uh, really, in his mind, saved her uh, education and, and helped her stay on the path uh, to help her achieve what she's achieved today as an adult. So administration, it, it was never a question of buy-in uh, at that level at the college. To be perfectly honest, where our buy-in um, was lacking initially was at the faculty level and, and at that time I was a still a faculty member and so I can speak to this uh, fairly directly. Um, faculty weren't um, given much training, much information about early colleges, and, and that was something we did not do well at EPCC. Uh, faculty were told, well, you may have some students that look a little bit younger than your other students. They may talk about having to catch the bus, or they may have to talk about their parents giving them a ride, and, and here's why, and here's who these students are, and good luck, and, and you know, we'll see you at the end of the semester. So. As an administration, the college really didn't do a lot to prepare our faculty. Um, as Mike was saying, there were some specific concerns in specific departments. Uh, certainly in the psychology discipline, we were concerned about, you know, can these students handle uh, content related to human sexuality or childbirth or, you know, mental disorders uh, the same way that, that a quote-unquote adult student could handle them. Um, same same issues in biology, same issues in art and literature. You know, do the the students have the life experiences and have the the maturity to handle these these topics, or are they going to be sitting in our classrooms giggling and making faces? And so, unfortunately, there was really no way that we could prepare faculty for the early college students and and the early college experience. Um, so that first semester was a little rough. The first year was a little rough. Um, but as Mike had shared, now those faculty that were initial naysayers are our largest cheerleaders <clears throat> when it comes to early college high schools. They've seen the successes. They've seen how the early college students <clears throat> are not afraid to 
to express themselves in class and, and work with traditional aged students. Um, and they're, they're in many ways the same as our other students, the same struggles trying to juggle coursework and trying to meet deadlines and trying to keep up with different faculty having different demands. And so we think for the most part that hesitation has been overcome and, and for the most part it is a positive uh, environment on our end. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the, the ways that we support our uh, school districts and our early colleges in, in particular are on the screen. Um, of course, we do uh, oversee the curriculum when it is a dual credit or early college course, whether it is at the early college building or at an EPCC building, it is the same curriculum that a student would receive in any other context. Um, and to help ensure that curriculum uh, is maintained, we do sit on the uh, early college high school faculty hiring committees. Uh, we do try to sit on the hiring committees when there's a principal or a counselor being hired, but, but we work with our school partners in our memos of understanding to ensure that we do have representation on the faculty hiring committees. Uh, we do offer administrative oversight. Um, every early college high school has an instructional dean on the EPCC side to work one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, our vice president of instruction and our vice president of student services is also involved to address um, policy and procedure issues, um, to help address uh, school-specific issues with registration or, or with um, course sequencing and, and transcripting of credit and things like that. Um, you, you'll see on the left-hand side, we also do provide some financial support. Uh, we do have our memo of understanding explicate what the school district is responsible for, what the college is responsible for, but we understand that uh, schools uh, need a lot and, and school districts budgets maybe aren't able to meet all of those tangibles and so the college does support each early college high school with an annual supply budget. On the right hand side of your screen you'll see um, some of the uh, intangibles that we offer. Uh, as Mike had mentioned in South Carolina, EPCC does have a leadership council uh, made up of both EPCC and uh, school district partners. Um, we meet as a group and, and with six early college high schools where you can imagine we're a fairly large group. Uh, we do meet at least once a semester to talk about common issues. Um, either things that are coming down from the state or things that we're seeing are popping up at, at more than one of our early college high schools. We also have individual uh, early college high school advisory committees and those are a little bit more intimate. Uh, those are made up of the uh, early college administration on that campus, so the principal, the counselor, uh, if they have a dean of students or an assistant principal as well as the EPCC dean that works with that campus, um, perhaps a faculty advisor to talk about specific issues that maybe don't need to be brought to the, to the larger leadership council. Those are typically convened um, monthly uh, in a perfect world if we can coordinate schedules, but at least uh, once a semester so that we can stay on top of any issues and, and be aware of any successes that the school is, is experiencing. Um, as Joel had mentioned in the national model, EPCC uh, has many of their early college high schools physically on our campuses. Four of our early colleges are, are on an EPCC campus. Um, we provide one main building for many of, of the early colleges and then the district <clears throat> and the college work to provide portables, mostly for the classroom experience um, or for a cafeteria or, or other student meeting space. Um, for two of our early college high schools that are off-site, we partner with the school district to find usable space, whether it's converting uh, another school within the district that can be a dedicated early college or finding a new building that we can assist with the purchasing of. So my take-home message uh, before I turn it back over to Helen uh, is pretty much to reiterate what Joel and, and what Mike had shared. Um, communication is super important. Um, in El Paso, we've had some turnover both at the college 
uh, and at the school districts in terms of administration. <clears throat> and so while an early college high school principal or a community college dean believes in the model, trying to remind the, the new president or the new superintendent about the model uh, has been an issue. Um, and, and regular meetings, staying in touch, and being just letting our early college partners know that we're here for them uh, and we are working together to ensure our students' success. And I think that that's it for me, unless there are any specific questions. I do. Uh, we have had a number of questions come in, Julie. One of them is um, okay. whether or not <clears throat> there's been any research to determine whether um, racial achievement gaps have been closed as a result of the, the program at EPCC. Um, that's a really good question, and um, I am not sure I can address that because our population in the county is uh, 90, uh, I take that back, it's 87 percent Hispanic and so we have had tremendous success rate with our uh, students of Hispanic origin but we don't have enough uh, students in our early college high schools in El Paso of other racial backgrounds that we can we can talk about that but uh, comparing what our students are achieving to what we see students nationally can uh, achieving, we do seem to be closing those gaps. Great, and and have you? Is there any data on EPCC grads in terms of post-secondary enrollment or workforce? Um, what it, mm -hmm. I think there's a it's a two-part question. It's you know the mm -hmm. success rate once they enroll uh, in four-year colleges or go to the workforce, and also whether or not they come back or stay in El Paso? Mm, good question. Um, and, and it's a really interesting question. Uh, I think we're much like Mike in that our first early college opened up in uh, 2006 and so our first graduates were in 2009 with the associate's degree. Um, we have had several students complete not only their four-year degree but go on and already complete or near completion on a graduate or professional degree. Um, you know, because of the numbers and because of, of when we started our program, we don't have a whole lot of data, but, but we have had um, dozens, I would say, uh, of stories like that. Um, and one of the most interesting stories is one of our early college students who was a graduate, uh, an early graduate, went to the four-year university, completed her degree, went to graduate school to get her degree in education so she could come back and be a teacher at our Clint Early College High School. So so she's a, a graduate and she's come full circle to continue to work in that setting. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So you'll notice the screen has uh, changed on the on the webinar. Just sit tight with us while I introduce uh, Dr. Andrea Berger, who has served as the project director for the National Evaluation of the Early College High School Initiative uh, since 2002. Uh, the evaluation you're going to hear from today uh, takes advantage of the lottery-based admissions used at many early college schools to determine the impact of winning admission to these schools on student outcomes, particularly outcomes uh, uh, such as high school graduation and college enrollment rates. Uh, in addition to her work on early college high schools, uh, Dr. Berger is also the project director of two NSF-sponsored project, uh, projects. The first is an evaluation of the Alliance for Graduate Education and the Professoriate in social, behavioral, and economic sciences fields, a program that supports underrepresented minority students pursuing doctoral degrees. And the second is an evaluation of the Association for the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography Minority Program, a program that uh, supports minority students interested in aquatic sciences. Um, she's also the project director of the evaluation of the fund for improvement of post-secondary education. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Andrea. Thank you, Helen. Um, uh, as Joel said, that this initiative uh, started in 2002 um, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and AIR has been the 
funded to be the evaluation partner of this initiative from the start. Um, our evaluation work took part, place in two phases. Uh, at, at, at the beginning, we were largely descriptive, trying to explore um, barriers and successes in, in getting this initiative going. Um, and in 2010, we switched to the, uh, the impact study. I'm going to give a brief overview of the descriptive work, and then the rest of this presentation is going to be about our recent impact work. So during the seven years that we were doing our descriptive work, we did extensive data collections with the initiative nationwide. Um, 70 site visits, we surveyed the entire population of schools annually, we surveyed over 5,000 students in 70 early college high schools, and some of our key findings were that these schools were in fact serving the intended population of students, that the early college students were outperforming the feeder district students on state assessments, they were accumulating college credit, and they were engaged with and actually attending um, college after they left the early college high school. Of course, with seven years of research, there's a lot more findings than I'm summarizing here, and all of those annual reports are available at our website. So the um, descriptive work had some promising findings, but our evidence was correlational. So the positive outcomes we were seeing could have been due to factors other than attending an early college high school. For example, early colleges may have been recruiting higher performing students from the areas that they serve, or maybe just students who chose to enroll in early colleges were more academically motivated or engaged with education than their peers. So we looked to an impact study to allow us to understand more definitively whether early colleges are more effective than other high schools at graduating students and propelling them into and through college. So after the descriptive work, our goal is to see if these positive outcomes were due to early colleges rather than due to the students they attract. So our two research questions are, do early college students have better outcomes than they would have had at other high schools, and do the effects of early colleges differ for students with different background characteristics? And the second question gets to the question that, um, about achievement gap that came up just, just before. So we'll, I will get to those findings in a minute. Um, but first, I'm going to walk you through how we came to our study approach. So to determine causation, ideally, we'd like to take a, a group of students, send them through a traditional high school, see what happens for a few years after high school, and then put them in a time machine and send them through an early college high school and see what happens to them then. But for obvious reasons, we can't do that. So the next best approach would be to randomly assign students to different high schools. For example, go into a school district and assign all incoming freshmen to either an early college high school or another high school. And random assignment is the gold standard in education research. And although students in treatment and comparison groups may differ, they shouldn't differ in any systematic way, at least on average. So any differences in outcomes could be attributed to the early college high school. And this approach can be accomplished at times. But usually, you are not able to go into a district and tell everyone which high school to go to. And in fact, in this study, we were not able to do that. However, if a lot of students are interested in attending an early college, um, and if the early college uses a lottery to select students, then you have random assignment, not of all students, but at least of some students, those students interested in attending an early college. And this is the approach taken by other researchers doing work in early college, for example, Julie Edmonds and her team at SIR are studying the impact of North Carolina early colleges. We took this approach as well, but we had one additional constraint to contend with. Our constraint was that we, our study time frame, we started in 2010, and we had to have post-secondary outcomes by the end of our study period, which was 2013. So we couldn't wait six to eight years for freshmen to make it through high school and through college. So how could we do an experiment so quickly? We went back in time, kind of. We looked for early colleges that had held lotteries in the past to admit students to their schools and kept the lottery record. So our approach is a retrospective randomized control trial, or retrospective RCT. So to, to recap, we found early colleges who used the lottery several years previously to accept students for admission. And we looked at who was randomly accepted and offered admission and who was randomly rejected and was not offered admission. Our treatment students are those that were offered admission to an early college high school, which is not quite the same as students who attend. And our comparison students are those who are not offered admission. Um, and 
most accepted students did enroll in the school, and most comparison students never attended an early college high school. To meet the needs of our retrospective RCT, uh, early colleges to, uh, had to meet quite a few criteria to participate. They had to be open long enough ago to have students could, um, be old enough to have post-secondary outcomes. They had to have graduates in our study years. They had to have used a lottery for admissions, or at least part of their admissions process. Some early colleges had some admissions criteria and then used a lottery to select from the eligible applicants. And then they had to have held on to those lottery records. And that gets us to the 10 early colleges that in our study. So we started with 154 early colleges that were open nationwide in 2007 and ended up with 10 early colleges in this study. So as you can see, this group is not representative of all of the early college high schools in the country overall, um, even if those schools are similar to these schools. We have three cohorts of students in our study. The oldest cohort started ninth grade in 0506. And then the youngest cohort started ninth grade in 0708. Uh, on a traditional time frame, we have four years of data past high school for the 0506 cohort and two years past high school for the 0708 cohort. So just to recap, we're dealing with 10 early college high schools with a total of about 25 students across the treatment or early college group and comparison group. In the study, about half of the students were female, minority, and low income, or eligible for free and reduced price lunch, and about one third were first generation college going. And um, both groups were performing above their state's means on their um, ELA and math scores from middle school. So before they even entered the early college high school, these students who are attracted to applying to an early college high school tended to be performing above the state mean. The data come from multiple sources. Um, we pulled record data from schools, districts, and states. And for post-secondary data, we use the National Student Clearinghouse, which captures about 91% of student enrollments in the country. But it undercounts the enrollments a little bit. And we have post-secondary data through summer 2013. We also surveyed the students about their experiences in high school and college after high school. I'm not going to present on those findings today, but they're available in the full report. Just a note about the um, data displays. The stars on the bars indicate a significant difference between the two groups. So here's the high school graduation findings. Early colleges had a significant impact on high school graduation rates. Early college students were more likely to graduate than high, uh, the comparison students. But you will notice that both groups are above 80%, showing that this is a group of students um, that was higher achieving than the, at least students nationally, and, and certainly the students in the districts that these students were coming from. For the assessments, I don't have a figure on this, but early college students uh, were scoring significantly higher on English language arts assessments, but there was no difference in math performance. So there's some evidence that this was a, an effective high school reform. But really, the differentiating feature of early colleges is the expected impact on college outcomes. So when we're looking at college enrollment, um, college enrollment can happen at many different times. And of course, it's going to happen earlier for early college students than for other students. Um, so we looked at our whole block of time that we had access to. And across that whole block, um, early, still early college students were enrolling in college at higher rates than comparison students. We also looked at just the traditional entrance point for college, which is the year after high school. Um, and even at that point, early college students were significantly more likely to enroll in college than comparison students. We also looked at the type of institution they enrolled in, a two-year versus four-year, because many of the early colleges were partnered with a two-year institution. And what we found is that early college students were significantly more likely to enroll in two-year colleges, but equally likely uh, to enroll in four-year colleges. So what we're seeing is that for students who are probably on a path to a four-year college anyway, uh, it wasn't impacting them, and it also wasn't preventing them from getting there, but sending them on a path to four-year colleges through the two-year college. Of course, post-secondary success isn't just about getting students to enroll, but about attaining a degree or credential that has real meaning for the workforce. So remember, these students are two to four years out of high school. 
25% um, of the early college students had um, attained a certificate associate's degree or bachelor's degree or more than one of those degrees during the time during the study period versus only 5% of the comparison students. Um, we also examined just our older cohort separately and there was no evidence of the comparison group catching up in degree attainment. But I want to point out that even if eventually um, the comparisons catch up to the early college students, there's a real world benefit to getting those degrees earlier, both in the cost savings to students and their families and their ability to start work or whatever their next education is earlier. Now I'm going to turn to the second research question about subgroups of students. We examined gender, race, low-income status, first-generation college-going status, and middle school achievement. Um, and for high school graduation, there were no differences in the impact for early college high schools. For college enrollment, there were no differences. What that means is that the impact that I showed you on high school graduation and college enrollment, it moved everybody the same amount. It didn't leave any group behind. For degree attainment, the effect of early college high schools was actually stronger for minority and low-income students. It was also stronger for students that did better in middle, on, as measured by their middle school uh, achievement. So the early college model didn't leave anyone behind. When differences did exist, the evidence suggested the impact was stronger for students traditionally underrepresented in higher education. So just to recap. Um, on almost every measure we examined, and there's certainly many more than I've presented in this brief presentation, early college students did better than comparison students. And as the initiative was moving, it moved everybody, not just the more advantaged students. Um, because of the study design and the robust nature of the findings, we see this as a study with strong internal validity, means that they were, we're really measuring the impact of early college high schools and not capturing something else like the types of students that it's attracting. However, the generalizability is limited, as I noted earlier, because we didn't randomly select the schools for our study. Nevertheless, this research makes an important contribution to understanding early colleges and the impact that they can have on students. Even students who are on a, uh, engaged with the education system, they're still seeing a benefit of attending an early college high school. We just had our most recent um, report came out this month, and that is available at the AIR website along with all of our previous reports. And thank you very much. Thanks, Andrea. Um, I just wanted to go back to a, a point you made uh, just a couple slides ago when you talked about the generalizability. We've had a lot of questions about that and um, wondered whether you could say some more about, um, I mean, one of the questions uh, we're, we've been asked is whether we um, think that the early college high schools that participated in the study are in some way representative of all early college high schools. Um, I don't think that we think that the, the schools from our study are representative, but what's fortunate is that because the early college model has gotten a lot of research, uh, with a lot of different methods, we're all starting to see the same story regardless of a research approach, which is what you want to see in, the, in kind of the, the scientific or research endeavor is to see replication from different researchers in different um, sub study sites. So for instance, the findings that I have with this impact study uh, match what we found earlier in our more exhaustive re research with the whole initiative. It also matches what um, the North Carolina group is finding, what they're finding on a research of just schools in Texas, what Joel mentioned about JFS is finding as they look in their study of data from 100 early college high schools. So all of these different experimental, quasi-experimental and descriptive studies are all pointing to the same story. And that's a really robust um, and I think convincing set of research. Thanks. And another question was related to uh, the power of place and whether or not there have been any um, comparisons uh, between the achievement of students uh, who attend early college high schools that are located on a college campus versus um, a standalone school in a district versus an early college high school that might be a school within a school. So we weren't able to look at that through our impact study. When we were um, looking at the, the 
early colleges nationwide, we had enough variability to uh, compare early college high schools on a campus versus not on a college campus. Uh, we weren't able to do the sub-question about school within a school. And we did find that um, at least uh, descriptively or correlationally, the early college high schools located on the college campus um, did have better outcomes than other early college high schools. But again, it's hard to know what's causing that. Are they selecting students differently because they know they have to be successful on the college campus? Are they attracting different students for that? So I can't um, make that same causal claim, but, but preliminary descriptive uh, research does support that early colleges on a campus were doing better with students. Thank you. So now I'd like to just uh, open up the conversation to the um, all of our panelists. Um, we've gotten a number of questions uh, related to um, the the challenge that uh, early college uh, high school uh, high schools face with targeting low income and and first generation college going students. Um, as we know, um, those students. Uh, face a number of different challenges, um, not all of which are uh, related to their academic achievement. And I wondered whether uh, some of you could perhaps talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the supports that early college high schools provide to address those additional challenges students face. Joel, do you want to do you want to weigh in first? Sure. Um, you know, I, I would probably end up for some more detail. I thought, you know, if he drilled down on some of the support systems and mechanisms that he mentioned, they folks would get a really good uh, flavor for this. But pe you know, it's a really good question, and it it is one that is a defining question for the partnerships. I would say that one thing that we shouldn't forget is, you know, I, I think that we've discovered and that we try to encourage in new partnerships is to try to start as early as possible with these young people. So if you can grab them in their middle school theater pattern, increasingly we see more schools that are actually incorporating middle school grades or really um, extending, you know, some explicit outreach to the theater area because the earlier you can begin to sort of rigorous instruction and for these uh, sort of college habits going to be to stick over time versus taking a student who is way behind in the ninth grade although we do see catch-up strategies that schools are using that are designed for the ninth grade as well but you know, I think it's more effective to get to get students earlier if you can um, otherwise you're you're double dosing, you know, uh, you're double dosing subject areas in which students uh, are weak. You're scaffolding, you know, to try to get them up uh, in the subject areas in their, where, they're, where they're weak and in the meantime accelerating them in places where they're stronger uh, to try to keep them on an accelerated path uh, and, you know, holding out the promise of courses. We even in early college schools, we've seen some, for example, if students don't qualify, if they're not ready for a college course, um, in one area uh, they do uh, get college courses in uh, some of the other areas, uh, subject matter, so that they can still feel like uh, they're on a path to a degree. Uh, and of course, you know, mean, in the meantime, the school is helping to try to support them to get ready in all areas. So I don't know. I mean, I uh, don't want to jump of turns here, but I don't, I don't know if Mike has anything else to add on the support system C has. I think one of the main things to look at from our perspective, and I'm hearing a lot of static, I don't know if that's me or not. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can hear you now. Okay. I'm sorry. I just couldn't even hear myself over some static I was hearing. Um, I think one of the biggest things for us is kind of like Joel was saying from the first time they step in in ninth grade is really you talking about being college ready. Um, one of the unique things we try to do is identify 
students that were um, had leadership potential but didn't really believe they had leadership potential and we created a class for leaders um, that we put in and we would have guest speakers come in and work with them and different things. I mean, we really found those students um, that are kind of in that gray area uh, step up because they had been labeled uh, leaders. It's, it's a, kind of the halo effect with that. Um, another thing that we like to do is when we have um, college and career night events and things like that, we have the college come up and we have those parents come. The, particularly, we invite the freshman parents so they can kind of see what paths are ahead of them. Um, so that we can break some of that barriers where they're talking to college professors and instructors and staff members so that they're not um, held in this high esteem that cannot be spoken to, but they are advocates that they can use when they get there. Um, we find that freshman seminar class is very important um, to build those academic skills and organizational skills and advocacy skills um, through those freshmen. Um, that we can work with that. Uh, we find that um, having after school, any student that's below 80% mastery on any assignment or on any class, we bring them in after school. Each content area has one day a week after school. They stay for 45 minutes to an hour for extra help in those, and that's mandatory if you're below that 80% threshold. So we really find that um, teaching them that habit, we find that they then will later go and get extra help as well, whether it's a writing center, math center, our um, help that we provide at other times, but it really helps them learn that it's important to go and get assistance and not just ignore it and hope it goes away. Um, so it's, it's definitely that wraparound in. We really believe in um, the teacher as counselor, not um, you know high level counseling with major issues, but just um, being a role model, a mentor, a, a person as the sounding board and offer things so we really hire our staff to meet the diverse needs of students um, so that each student would have a person to go and relate to even our IT serves in that role as well so he has a group of students that he informally will mentor and help guide and encourage um, so really it's a whole staff event it can't be a system where it's my job not your job it's um, definitely a wraparound service within the school that helps provide that support thank you uh, Julie, I didn't know whether you wanted to weigh in on that that question as well. Well, um, we we uh, work with our schools. Most of our early colleges offer a two week uh, summer boot camp to kind of help students transition from that middle school uh, straight into the early college. Uh, and so we work with our uh, early college principal and and his or her staff uh, to to talk a little bit with the students, but but really I think most of that work is done through the ISDs and through the early colleges rather than through the community colleges. Great, thank you, um, Mike. Another question uh, that we've had is uh, when you were talking, you mentioned that uh, South Carolina pays for the tuition, and uh, folks are wondering how fees and books are paid for. Uh, well, the the state allows each um, college and university to waive up to a certain percentage, and I think it's still four percent of um, their funding, uh, and so that's where our students fall in for tuition. We, as a school, as a high school, we buy the college textbooks. I'd love to say that we reuse those, but it seems that um, college editions are changed nearly every semester, if not every year, and with the growing amount of online subscriptions that they need um, definitely uh, is a cost last year or actually this year we're going to be at about forty seven thousand dollars that we spent out of our local school budget so we have some different community groups um, foundations that help donate to our school um, for that cause to help offset that cost um, as far as fees um, if those come up we usually work with the college to see is there a way that we can um, have that fee uh, waived, but that really hasn't come up very often. Typically, that'll come up like in a science fee. Um, they don't charge our students student fees because they're not using the student services quite as much, so um, they don't charge that piece of it. Um, they just uh, keep that within the fee waiver. Julie, is, is this something that comes up in the, the meetings that you have with the early colleges that uh, uh, El Paso Community College collaborates with? Oh, absolutely. And and across the state, we joke about the 
the three T's that are the barriers to early college success, uh, transportation, textbooks, and and the Texas Higher <laughs> Education Coordinating Board. Um, but textbooks might, might hit it on the head uh, with the changing editions, with the access codes. Um, w at the college, we do offer faculty a uh, choice in which book to use, and so you know, two, two faculty teaching the English class are going to use two different sets of books, and that really does create uh, a predicament for our, our ISD partners. Um, we try to work with them as much as possible. We know that some of the schools have used their supply budget that we offer. Um, when their districts are saying we, we can't give you another 100,000 for textbooks this year. So it really is a burden and we're trying to figure out alternate instructional materials to help keep these students focused on the curriculum rather than on these kind of administrative issues that keep popping up and getting in their way. Thank you. Um, Joel, in a, in a minute or less, can you, well, can you talk about whether all early college high schools are charters? I think there was some, uh, because uh, Mike represents a charter organization, do you, do you want to just in a minute or so say, say a word about that? Sure, I can probably be even quicker. Um, most of the early college schools are actually not charter schools, although there is a significant substantial contingent of charter schools. By my last reckoning, probably around, I would want to say 20, 25% are charter schools, but the rest are, um, you know, quote unquote, regular public schools uh, in partnership with uh, local higher ed institutions. And, and to build on what Joel's saying, um, that's my experience too, is typically um, they're not charter schools. And to be honest, with the cooperation with a school district, it's easier to make sure you're serving that underrepresented population. and. Uh, dispersing some of the needs. Transportation is definitely one that's easier. Um, so no, the, the typical early college in my experience is, is not a charter school. Thank you. Um, so we've gotten a number of really great questions um, as a result of, of uh, this webinar today. I want to thank uh, all of our presenters and uh, remind our audience that uh, this is actually the second of a three-part series. Um, the the uh, first webinar, uh, Understanding Accelerating Learning Across Secondary and Post-Secondary Education, can be found on the College and Career Readiness and Success website. Uh, you'll find an archived version of this uh, webinar today uh, on the website, uh, AYPFs and uh, the College and Career Readiness and Success. And then we'd like to um, announce the third in this series, Dual Enrollment, the Role of Policy in Promoting Quality Pathways to Post-Secondary Success, which is scheduled for February 13th. Um, I want to encourage you to access our blog, where today's presenters will be addressing some of the great questions that uh, we haven't gotten to. And uh, I want to thank you all for uh, joining us today and for asking uh, your great questions and uh, look forward to uh, uh, hearing from you on the 13th again. So thank you again to our, our panelists uh, for the uh, time and the presentations and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, I hope.